welcome to this webinar organized by ELSA and for IP Council about AI and IP challenges. My name is Axel Frazzini and I am the Managing Director of 4IP Council, a not-for-profit organization based in Brussels. We are focusing on promoting the roles of IP in innovation. To identify the most relevant topics and produce empirical research, we work closely with a wide variety of academics, experts, IP organizations, and stakeholders. On our website, you can find a range of free materials, studies, guidelines, summaries of relevant papers and recordings of our webinars, like the one today. Moreover, we produce easy to digest content, especially tailored for non-IP experts, SMEs, and startups. This is free of charge. Some examples are interactive graphics, interviews to inspire uh, young entrepreneurs. With this, we aim to assist innovative startups and SMEs to learn how to use IP to grow their businesses. Without further delay, please allow me to introduce today's speakers. Marta duque Lizarald is an LLM um, owner and is a doctoral candidate and research associate at the Technical University of Munich, TUM. Prior to joining TUM, she worked as an IPR policy researcher at Ericsson. And Steven Potter, advisor and business development at IPROVA, a Swiss UK startup that is rapidly delivering highly diverse inventions with the help of its novel AI, machine learning, NLP software. After this presentation, we will have a Q&A with some of the most common questions regarding the IP challenges in AI. If you have other questions that you would like to address to the speakers, feel free to do so by sending them to info at 4ipcouncil.eu. Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and to speak about artificial intelligence and intellectual property. Artificial intelligence is, in fact, one of the most critical technologies of our era. It is, is spreading across many different industries, automating some production processes, and changing the way business is conducted. So the benefits are huge. But even if the popularity of AI increased in the last few years, the term AI is nothing new. And it was first employed in the 1956. And since, since then, it has suffered some ups and downs called uh, AI summers and winters under, until the current boom that started in 2013 because of the increased availability of connectivity, computing power, the large amount of data that are, is being produced, improvements in algorithms, and of course, raising funding. But what is artificial intelligence? We don't have a single definition, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to use the following one. AI is a discipline of computer science that is aimed at developing machines and systems that can carry out tasks considered to require human intelligence. So the goal of artificial intelligence is to automate and accelerate the performance of an intellectual task by means of its systematization. And even if the uh, tasks that AI systems are performing are more and more complex, their purpose remains limited. It means that the existing systems, the AI systems belong to the category of narrow AI, but the prospect of an artificial general intelligence is still far away. And sometimes machine learning and artificial intelligence have been used as synonyms when they are actually not. And machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence aimed to create pattern recognition systems that can learn to make predictions about data by adjusting to previous data. 
and we mainly have three types of machine learning, meaning supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. In supervised learning, the AI systems are trained with labeled data, and they must recognize the label in new data sets. In unsupervised learning, on contrast, the AI systems are trained with unlabeled data, and they must discover the hidden underlying structure. And finally, in reinforcement, the system has one goal, and according to its performance, it will receive penalties or rewards. And the objective is to maximize the amount of rewards. And it has been successful, for example, for training AI systems in the field of playing games. And um, AlphaGo was trained with reinforcement learning. And one of the most heated debates nowadays is that of how to protect the AI-generated outputs, precisely because there has been a misunderstanding uh, about how this technology really works. But AI systems are not capable of um, generating works or inventions without any kind of human intervention. And first, we are going to discuss the inventorship claims. It has been stated that the most sophisticated AI systems are capable of creating inventions autonomously, and that's not true. But the debate became even more popular since 2019, when Dr. Thaler filed two patent applications listing an AI system called Devils as the inventor. The patent applications were rejected at the EPO, UK IPO, and USPTO. And as the patent offices, the UK High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia rightly pointed out, in the patent test of it, the inventor is addressed with pronouns that are only used for natural persons. So if we interpret the term inventor so broadly as to include AI systems, we will contradict their plain reading. In addition to this, AI systems lack uh, legal personality, the capacity to own IP rights and therefore to transfer them. But recently, the South Africa Patent Office issued the patent and the Federal Court of Australia held that AI uh, systems can be inventors. So <laughs> the debate continues. And the main problem with this debate is that autonomy is confused with automation. And when we uh, uh, use AI in the invent process, Many steps are automated, but the invention can be still uh, at, uh, the conception of the invention can be still attribut uh, attributable to the human being. And this is different for the question of determining who are the, inv the inventors of an AI-assisted invention. And this is challenging because the number and degree of contributors. Uh, depend uh, then sorry the number and degree of contributions by different actors vary according to the specific um, uh, purpose and the application of uh, the AI technology concern. Also, the patentability of AI assisted invention raised some concerns uh, with relation to the novelty and inventive step, and that's because the if the number. Uh, the number of information constituting the prior art is already increasing uh, with the um, with the use of ai in the inventive process this information will incre increase even more and this will make the examination will make the examination of the novelty requirement even more challenging and also the AI systems can perform some links between the elements of the prior art that will be really difficult for humans to, to find. And then I argue that patent examiners should also be assisted with AI when examining this type of invent, uh, inventions, because otherwise there's a risk that poor quality uh, patents will be granted. And now let's uh, explore the authorship debate. For a work to be copyrightable, it must be original. And according to the Court of Justice, a uh, work is original when it is the author's own intellectual creation, which is manifested by his free and creative choices. And if we go to the Bern Convention and some European copyright directives, we can notice that even if it is not explicitly mentioned, 
it is implicit that the author should be a human being. Now, following the academic debate, we must distinguish between AI assisted inventions and AI generated uh, works, sorry, and AI generated works. According to the WIPO, AI assisted works are those created with material human intervention, while AI generated works are those created without human intervention. And many of the results that today are referred as AI generated, including the super famous Next Rembrandt, are actually AI assisted because the human intervention in the different phases that predetermine the outcome is both uh, relevant and original. Mm, therefore, I think that the WIPO definitions may lead to, con uh, to confusion. And a more appropriate term for the type of existing works that do not reserve, uh, deserve copyright protection is that of authorless AI assisted creations. Um, this term was first adopted in, in the uh, trends and developments in AI report. Mm, that is a very nice report. And if you have time or are interested on this topic, I can recommend you to read. Examples of mm, these works could be the initial uh, translation performed by people or some text generated with very advanced um, language models such as GTP3. Uh, and in the creation of these works, there's human intervention, but it is not of an original nature, so they cannot be protected by copyright. And now there is a debate of whether this authorless creation can be protected by um, the existing related rights. Uh, because they don't ask for human authorship or for originality. But there's who maintain that mm, maybe we need a legislative reform because the ownership of mm, these rights is still conceived for human beings. What seems clear is that part of the academic community reject the idea of authorless creations falling into the public domain. And they have mm, proposed to create a new exclusive right. In my opinion, this might not be the best approach. First, because we don't have an economic study uh, that supports the creation of this new right. And secondly, because uh, those employing um, creative AI systems uh, already have some tools, as, such as unfair competition or um, trade secrets. But uh, this is a hot debate, and let's see finally what happens. But now it's time to move on and explore two other topics that are at least equally important and also deserve our attention. The first one being the IP protection of AI features. And this is key because having an adequate IP strategy enables the company to benefit from their investments in AI and also to create and maintain a competitive advantage. So AI systems are composed by algorithms that by themselves are not copyrightable, but they are encoded in a programming language and embedded in software. And this software can be protected by copyright. However, copyright uh, protection only extends to the code, but the functional aspects of the software or the underlying ideas and principles are not protected by copyright. The same applies for the code that is available in the machine learning frameworks to train the, the models. And now there is a debate about whether machine learning models can be protected by copyright or not. Some maintain that they are algorithms, others that, yeah, they are software, but they are not original. Mm, there's also, uh, also who thinks that maybe some complex and dynamics models can be protected by the generous database right. And finally, there are proposals to create a new CGNUS right. So we need further research on, on this topic. Then the algorithms, the models, the weights and evaluation mechanisms composing AI systems are of a mathematical nature. So when they are claimed as such, they are excluded from patentability according to the European Patent Convention. But if they are applied in an invention with technical character, they can be protected as elements of a broader invention. And finally, those 
features that cannot be protected by copyright or patents or simply that the companies don't want to disclose can be protected by trade secrets. And when I was explaining the functioning of AI, I hope you noticed that AI development is dependent on the availability of large and high quality data sets. But even if the amount of data that is being produced is increasing, the potential is still underused. And now I'm only going to address the B2B data sharing concerns, but there are also B2G concerns and of course B2B, even if in this field we have the open data directive. And the first legal barrier could be the uncertainty about which IP rights are embedded in the training data sets. Raw data is not protected by copyright, but there are some images, sounds, videos, text that are publicly accessible and freely available on websites and are protected by copyright and related rights. Then if we use this material for the AI training um, and this use is not covered by an exception, such as the one of text and data mining, we will need a license. It is also unclear whether the training data sets can be protected by copyright or the Sui database file. But now some companies are protecting both the raw data and the databases that cannot be protected um, by copyright or related rights, but by means of factual control. Still triggering B2B data sharing can be challenging. And that's because the operators could fear to lose a competitive advantage. And also that uh, they fear that the data will not be used in accordance to the contractual terms. And that's where competition law enters the picture. But companies cannot be forced to share their data just because they have a competitive advantage uh, because of the factual control and have refused to license it. Uh, they can only be forced to license data in, under the circumstances of the essential facilities doctrine. What's the problem? <laughs> that data may not be essential uh, because it's feasible to find a substitute. So it's uh, also a great debate. Mm, and now the European Commission has stated that compulsory access to data on front terms will be needed where specific circumstances so require. And we need more clarity about what are those specific circumstances and also what will be framed in this field. Also, competition law applies ex exposed, and I have the feeling that we need ex ante regulation. But both the academic uh, community and the industry agree that we don't need one size fits all and rigid regulation. We need better a flexible approach um, to promote voluntary B2B data sharing. And in this regard, the European Commission issued in 2018 guidelines with some principles to which the parties might adhere if they want to share um, data under fair contractual terms. But they have proven to be insufficient. And now the European Commission has stated that it will continue to assess whether amended principles and possible co codes of conduct are sufficient to maintain fair and open markets, will address the situation, and if necessary, will take appropriate action. So yeah, let's see. <laughs> um, to finish with my presentation, I want to you know some uh, two final statements. The first one is that we need definitions that really reflect the current state of the debate. And I was mentioning that the white for definitions might not really reflect what is going on and may lead to confusion. And now it's time for us people from the legal world to make an effort and try to understand uh, how this technology works. And secondly, the European Commission should create a flexible B2B data sharing framework that takes into account the different interests of the players and also the rapid changes that are occurring in both the AI and the data sector. But there are still many open questions like, do we maybe need the recommendation of the standard licensing terms? What's the role of the open source community? Maybe is it better to have a method for controlling unfair terms or a front model for access? 
that's the topic of my doctorate. So maybe in some years I, I will be able to come back and give you some thoughts and solutions. Yeah, I hope. Uh, I, I, I hope you thank you for your attention and uh, I hope also that you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, let me check. So uh, I think that we need to move on to the, the, the Q&A session and make sure that we can cover as many questions as possible. So uh, here I have a list and uh, feel free to, to, to jump in, you know, uh, when you want to, to say something. But I would like to start the first question for you, Marta. Okay. Does any state have a legal framework for regulating AI generated works at the moment? Yes, uh, actually there are some states that already address this issue. And those states are Ireland, UK, uh, New Zealand, uh, India, South Africa, and Hong Kong. Uh, and they have a special regime for uh, computer generated works. Uh, that are described as those that, uh, in which there's no human author or the author is not an individual. There are some authors that think that they are uh, great regulations and that we should implement something similar here in the EU. But my position is different. Uh, I think that they don't address the situation in a satisfactory manner uh, because they grant copyright to someone that is not uh, the author is not the first time that do it, but still, also they classify as a work, uh, a creation uh, that is created uh, in a non-original way. Um, and the main problem is that, in yeah, again, in my opinion, you can totally disagree. Um, copyright is not the best tool to to address this uh, this topic, uh, this situation. Mm. But yeah, that's personal opinion. But okay, okay. So to just to follow up on on this uh, specific point, uh, how do text and data mining exceptions apply? Okay, um, as I was explaining in the presentation, if we use some material that is protected by copyright and we don't have a license or there's uh, any exception. Um, yeah, we will be infringing. But we may have an exception, and it's the text and data mining one. And actually, there are two exceptions. And they are mandatory and were created by uh, in the European Digital Single Market Copyright Directive. So we should go to Article 3 and to Article 4. First, Article 3, um, it benefits the research organizations and the cultural heritage institutions when they are doing text and data mining for research proposals. So companies uh, will not be covered. But then we have to move uh, to Article 4, and it benefits all the players that want to do text and data mining for any purpose, meaning commercial or no commercial. Uh, the only requirement is that they have lawful access to the material. So in this time, companies, large, small, smith, everyone will be covered. But the legislator uh, implemented that opt-out mechanism. So if the right holder reserved the right for himself, uh, we still need a license. And for example, if the material is uh, uh, uploaded in a website, uh, the, copy the copyright holder can reserve the right by means of machine read uh, by machine readable means. So always when you are using a material that is mm, publicly accessible and freely available, make sure that the right holder didn't reserve the right that, that's a good point uh, i think that we have a key question now for steven oh. uh, everybody is talking about artificial intelligence and software but could you describe the key features of ai software Ooh. well that's a very large question first of all thank you very much by the way to axel and the four ip council for allowing me and elsa for allowing me to participate in this seminar I should also introduce myself that I'm a practicing chemist. I am neither a patent agent nor a lawyer. So my comments are related to 20 years experience that I've had in the intellectual property field. So that's a bit of a 
uh, a legal uh, footnote. Uh, yeah, I think the uh, Marta, in fact, did, of course, introduce the concepts of artificial intelligence. Um, I would put it uh, slightly differently, but it's simulating human intelligence by machines and software. Now, what are the real drivers for it from my point of view? The real drivers are, the ex first of all, the explosion of information. Uh, it's now being said that uh, data is going to be doubling every 20 days from now on. And if you consider an autonomous vehicle, it is generating terabytes of data per day that have to be handled. I mean, these are massive, massive sums of uh, uh, amounts of data which are being generated. Secondly, uh, Marta did mention the word connectedness, but I would say uh, almost convergence. If I take, if I take a, a standard uh, Huawei, dare I say it, uh, mobile phone, um, then the functions and the technology associated with this are a, a universe away from those uh, of a dial-up phone from 30 years ago. So you've got two enormous drivers. One is the information explosion, and the second is the convergence of technology between very widely different areas. Uh, so that means that the old-fashioned concept about a Leonardo da Vinci knowing all of the information that there was in the world and able to invent helicopters and guns and all the rest of the things he did, that is a concept which is now no longer possible. There is too much information, too much, too much connectedness, too many um, tie points between all sorts of different parts of the world. And so we actually need some kind of software that can handle all of this. And for want of a better word, that is artificial intelligence. I think um, Marta has already mentioned uh, machine learning as being a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, uh, another subset, which I think is quite interesting, is natural language processing, um, which enables computers to understand and process human languages and to get uh, data computers closer to a human level understanding of language and text. Now, there are two key features about the use of artificial intelligence. One is what Marta has already described at, or both of which Marta has already mentioned. One is the use of very large data sets on which the uh, software can operate, and then appropriate training of the software in the areas of interest to the operator. Now, uh, data sets we're also, I think, probably going to talk about a little later. Training has become very, uh, I would say, uh, I wouldn't say not subjective, uh, argumentative at the moment, because training can be biased. So there's uh, a lot of work going on about biasing training, looking at data, particularly on grounds of gender and ethnicity. And in fact, there's quite a lot of work going on in the intellectual property field uh, uh, about those kind of aspects when it comes to looking at the quantity and quality of, uh, of patents, for example, which are being created by people from different backgrounds. Is that enough for you, Axel? Does that introduce i think this is a very good introduction to ai software but just to to follow up um, could you outline how ai techniques can be used in the areas of intellectual property ah yes well uh i mean intellectual property really is defined by a whole series of data sets involving text images musical notation symbols and all sorts of other kind of things and of course, uh, we're particularly concerned in ELSA and indeed in also my work with, with legally protected uh, intellectual property, uh, such as patents, trademarks, copyrights, designs, and the like. Um, uh, now, intellectual property as such in all of these aspects can be provided in a structured uh, way. And we've already mentioned patent and trademark databases, which are, which are uh, very well structured, very well known. But you've also got to recognize that within, for example, the patent world, all of the basic text inside a patent is in fact unstructured. <laughs> um, and indeed, artificial intelligence techniques can be used to handle both analyses of the structured databases, patent databases, patent classifications and the like, and also by the use of natural language processing techniques and semantic techniques, also the unstructured data inside the body uh, of the patent. Now, if you then start considering intellectual property, first of all, intellectual property must be created. And artificial techniques have been used to create uh, trademarks, designs, music, art, and literature. Uh, I don't know whether you followed the, uh, the composite portrait 
which was made a couple of years ago and which was sold for four hundred and thirty two thousand dollars and this was a portrait which was claimed to have been created by uh, by uh, artificial intelligence techniques the problems in the pattern world are perhaps a little bit trickier about uh, about uh, people claiming to create inventions by the use of uh, intellectual property. I think something that you could be aware of and could be following up is that while the uh, US and UK and European patent offices have rejected the so-called Darbus case, there is an absolutely lively debate going on and both the World Intellectual Property Organization and the U.S. Patent Office are carrying out conversations as to how to handle uh, this, uh, this problem and seeing if anything can handle the procedural problem that there is at, at present, that the inventor can only be human. And my personal belief is that that will, over the next five years, get, get, get handled. And I'm not saying that South Africa and Australia will become dominant, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if all of the national patent offices find some way of uh, accepting uh, patents that uh, can be shown in some way or other to have been created by artificial intelligence. So the first thing is then creation. If you then start applying for patents or a trademark or indeed any other form of intellectual property, first of all, you need to be, in the case of patents, you need to be, they need to be shown that they are patentable, that they're novel, not obvious, and capable of industrial application, or in the case of a trademark, that they're unique and distinguishable. And these qualities can all be checked by uh, analyzing, by artificial te intelligence techniques, uh, the available databases, and trying to establish if there's some kind of possible freedom, of, if you're creating a patent, if there's some kind of possible freedom of use, uh, and also trying to find any dangerous prior arts. You then get on to saying, okay, I've, I have my invention. I've checked it out against uh, existing databases. I now have to apply for the patent, draft it and apply it. Artificial techniques can now be used to at least carry out initial drafts of, uh, of patenting and of claims, which I think is very interesting. Um, and uh, if then this is then presented to the patent search or the search offices for either patents or trademarks, they can in turn analyze these applications by using their own version of artificial intelligence based analytics. Now, in, in, in traditional times, you all spoke about, is this novel? Is this obvious to the person skilled in the art? Well, these days, the search offices are applying all sorts of artificial intelligence techniques to check this. And you can now almost start talking about machine skilled in the art. In other words, can your application get past the artificial intelligence based screening being put up by the, by the examination techniques? Um, supposing that you've done all these things, you've created, you've applied, and your patent has been, or trademark has been accepted. But then you get into the thing, oh, somebody's infringing my patent or infringing my trademark. How can you find this out? Well, artificial in intelligence techniques are being used research, uh, for research in this kind of basis, both in terms of uh, legal documents and also in terms of company documents, for either attack or defense, trying to look at previous cases also when it comes to litigation that could say whether um, a case is, is likely to succeed or not. Um, and indeed, artificial intelligence techniques can even be used to create draft documents to either attack or defend uh, the particular position of the company. So if you as our legal students uh, in training, I think you really do have to be aware of all of these kinds of different aspects of artificial intelligence. If you then come to the final stage and you come to litigation uh, in the court or indeed trying to resolve conflicts, well then artificial techniques are being increasingly used uh, in both of these kinds of areas. So there you are. If you think about artificial intelligence and intellectual property or legally protected intellectual property, then artificial intelligence is there for creation. It's there for research. It's there for drafting. It's there for examination. It's there for resolution of conflicts and for litigation. So it's it, these days it is everywhere in the IP world. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's very, very interesting. Uh, but it leads me to back to Marta on a very um, uh, very important question regarding data. Uh, 
would the creation of an AI, um, um, no, let's, let's rephrase, would the creation of an intellectual property right to protect raw data be desirable? Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I probably will need to be in a more advanced stage of my doctorate to answer properly, but I know that in 2017, um, the European Commission proposed to create a new exclusive right uh, that it was called the Data Producers' Right. Um, it was to cover the non-personal uh, machine-generated data. And the reasoning was that um, if we have an exclusive right with clear and defined uh, exceptions, maybe the parties feel more comfortable and start to share more data. But it was a right um, that actually was very criticized. Um, it was said that it will lead to more legal uncertainty, that there was no economic justification for the creation of this new right, and also that it was an undesirable government uh, government um, participation. <laughs> uh, like uh, they found the industry found it quite intrusive. So finally, the commission didn't proceed with this proposal. Um, let's see if finally it comes back again or or not. But apparently, the industry preferred to uh, use contract law. Uh, but sometimes the contractual restrictions to access or use, use of data can be also be hard. And so, yeah, once I have a more elaborated conclusion, I will also let you know. But could, could I just make one comment there, Axel and, and Marta? Sure. And that, that is, what is raw? What is raw? That's an interesting question. I mean, if you take an autonomous vehicle, you, you're generating, as I say, these terabytes of data, and they're coming from all over the car. They're coming from sensors in the car. The data is coming from uh, interactions of the driver and the passengers, maybe with applications from service companies. There's, uh, there are all sorts of interactions passing between the, the car and the, uh, and the um, telecommunications network with which it's, uh, with which it's, uh, with which it's interacting. Raw is a very thoughtful word, I would have thought. Any, uh, so any, any then let's, let's try to continue about raw and, and structured data. Um, Stephen, are there problems in finding and using data sets for AI work in the IP field, in your opinion? Um, <laughs> the answer is yes and no. There's a very good German word, yein. Um, which I think is, uh, I, I'm afraid I use far too often. Um, there are plenty of open source databases which can be used for IP work. And I'm particularly thinking now uh, because of the experiences that I'm having uh, in, 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 in the pattern world. Uh, I mean, all of the national uh, and global trademark databases are available and they're available for free. Um, <laughs> there are, of course, um, various professional uh, database companies or analytical patent database companies that say, oh, well, the U.S. patent database is there. But you've also got to be aware that there are all sorts of failures and, and, and false uh, attributions and all sorts of things going on there. And so we are going to provide a corrected database for the U.S. patent office database. And for that, you must pay. But in general, the, the U.S. patent office database is available, can be used. Uh, and um, if you are looking at these kind of things, um, there is uh, an organization called Lens.org, which claims to have uh, corrected uh, at least some of the more uh, egregious examples of, uh, of, of mislabeling in the U.S. Patent Office database uh, that, that, that can be used by everybody. There's then an awful lot of uh, open source uh, XML and SQL databases using 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 data from all sorts of sources, and one in particular uh, called uh, OpenAlex.org is a free and open source for all the world's scholarly papers, researchers, journals, and institutions. Uh, so that's covering quite a lot of technological background if you are trying to to to, to work to create some new patterns. 
Um, but, of course, there is data which is not uh, immediately available. Personal data uh, protected by GDPR and the like is of particular interest, for example, in the health field or the health and medical fields. And so people are trying to make this more available so that there can be swapping of, of patient data between Finland and Puerto Rico um, by, by uh, anonymization uh, of all of the data and, uh, and the like. So, so personal data is, uh, is now protected by legislation under GDPR. Uh, certain data sources are copyright protected um, and uh, they're only available on a commercial basis and you're going to have to pay some money in order to get access to them. But it, again, they are there if you have money in your back pocket to be able to open them up. I, I think, yeah, so, so, so Yain, there's a huge amount of data now available. Uh, I mean, we are working in the company in which I'm working, um, creating inventions. And for that, we are looking essentially or using only really open source databases. And we are not finding that a hindrance uh, to the work that we're doing. That, that's pretty clear. Now let's try to go back to the legal part. Uh, so Marta, should the dialogue between the legal and technological sectors be reinforced? Uh, yeah, I, I <laughs> think so. <laughs> uh, as I was also mentioning during the presentation, companies mm, should have an adequate IP strategy to have benefits from their investments and also should know uh, which elements are protected by IP rights in order to don't uh, commit infringements. And as legal practitioners are concerned, let me briefly share my personal experience. I started to study all this uh, whole AI thing when I, when I was writing my bachelor thesis. And at that time I, I knew nothing and I defended <laughs> that uh, AI systems are creating uh, copyrightable works completely autonomously and that we need a new related right. Uh, in, it's practically the opposite of what I have been <laughs> defending today. Um, this is because before uh, reading more technical literature, uh, I realized that some of the factual premises that I was using were fake. Um, now that I'm writing the, well, starting writing the thesis, uh, I'm trying to read more and more technical literature to really understand what uh, I'm doing because otherwise I will spend <laughs> some years of my, of my, lar of my life um, studying something that is useless. So I really want to understand what are the necessities of the market and um, we cannot assess on something or regulate something that we don't understand. Um, and I think uh, we both parts must make an effort, um, try to understand the people from the other sector, how things actually work in understandable terms that is not always easy. And then we will create a win-win situation. Yeah. Yeah, very clear. Um, I think, Stephen, you have covered really quite some part related to patents. Yeah. But I have one last question. Uh, could you outline the current situation in the patents world? Oh. <laughs> the current but, uh, Briefly, the and then world. we'll move to, to the last question. Well, I think I think uh, I think in 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 the answer that I gave to your previous question, as far as patents are concerned, really artificial intelligence techniques are used at all aspects of the patenting process: creation, uh, drafting, um, examination, search, resolution of conflicts, uh, and the like. Um, could I perhaps make a slightly make a slightly uh, personal uh, thing and just say a little bit about how we're using it in in the company that I'm working with? Would that be helpful? Um, well, I mean, we are trying to create inventions for major global companies. And uh, the way that we try to do this is the following. We try to have, I'll use my hand, we try to use uh, a request from a company in a particular way. 
And we then enrich that in particular ways by creating things that are significant to the request for the company. And that, that then acts as the feed for our artificial intelligence software. So our artificial intelligence software goes out over the web looking at open source material, nothing we don't really like paying money for lots of commercially available uh, data so we go out and look at open source software and suddenly ping the software says ah oh, here's an item of information which is new which has some relevance to the need of our client and we call these invention triggers and these triggers then come back into our offices and they're filtered by our human developers and our human uh, developers then create uh, a, uh, a patent or a description of a patent uh, for our for our customers um, and we we say what the hints were what the what the invention is what the significance of the invention is and we then uh, pass these on to our clients so that's the way that we are using artificial intelligence in the creation of inventions now whether you I guess you would call that AI assisted Marta uh, it certainly isn't AI generated, but the point is that if you take any any particular company, uh, then they have a core technological and business uh, view of their of their of their of their business. But what they're highly unlikely to, to to know is what is happening in areas way away from their core business, and what the significance of that can be to their business, um, which is this. A basic question that I addressed right at the beginning about technological convergence. Um, you know, uh, we did some work where we were looking at headphones uh, for a particular client, and we discovered a paper that said that there were light sensitive organs behind the ear, and that uh, and that uh, the uh, and that uh, people. Uh, so we took that information, we took it together with the information that people suffer in the winter from what they call seasonal affective disorder, which they then handle by shining light on their eyes or on their body to, to try and handle it. And uh, we came up with an invention where headphones actually had a light source um, stimulating the light source behind the ear to try to help the, the, the users of these headphones uh, suffer no longer from seasonal affective disorder. Now, I mean, if you're making a headphone, the last thing you're going to be doing is reading an academic paper about light sensitive things behind your, behind your head. You, you just aren't gonna do it. But the fact is that using artificial intelligence software in the way that we did, we could see the significance of this, uh, of this uh, piece of information and uh, in, uh, turn it into uh, an invention which was then accepted by the company. So, you know, artificial intelligence is, is everywhere. Yeah, that's, that's a very good example. Thank you. And to try to conclude, uh, I would like to, to have an open question to both of you. Um, could you. Could you cite possible areas of change in the use of AI techniques in the IP world of like over the next five to 10 years? Uh, from a legal perspective, from a more technical perspective, what's your guess? Over to you, Marta, to start off with. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess, as um, Stephen uh, was mentioning before, uh, some law firms will start using AI. So finally, uh, we will automate some processes and we will spend more time maybe in uh, analyzing the results or, or in other tasks. So we will have to uh, adapt to the, uh, to the new situation. Uh, also, mm, yeah, patent offices that uh, will, will use AI for examining applications, also uh, trademark offices. And, yeah, but I, I don't know, things are evolving so fast that maybe I'm predicting something and it's more advanced or so yeah, we will see but it's really interesting uh, yeah uh, I mean on 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 my behalf uh, I believe that there will be a resolution of this problem about uh, the inventorship uh, of uh, of algorithmically generated or created inventions uh, now uh, I won't even argue whether 
whether algorithms can create in the first place, but assuming that, that assuming that you you you, you get sufficient evidence that they can, then I think there's going to be some way of handling the procedural problems, which insists that all inventors have to be human. I think, I, I don't know how it's going to be fiddled, but it will be fiddled somehow, I'm sure. Um, uh, then you get on to the question about the ownership uh, of AI-assisted or AI-generated inventions and uh, a practical solutions will come for that. It's a little bit like the problem. Can you remember there was that case a couple of years ago where a chimpanzee took the photos? And so was the chimpanzee the, the creator, the inventor, or the owner of the photos that were made? And this was a case which was brought by PETA, you know, the protection of animal rights and so on. Now that went to, I'm not sure it didn't even go to the Supreme Court in the US, but it, it got solved in a practical way. So I think I think these things, there will be practical ways to, to be able to handle these kind of things. My personal belief is that there will be, uh, Axel did ask the question about data sources, that, that data sources will be increasingly available for people to use because people aren't going to be able to avoid using artificial intelligence techniques. So we're going to be driven to using them. And so then the users of that are going to be driven to want more and more data to feed them. So, you know, I mean, I think there are business and, and practical reasons to say that I won't say data will become free, but it will certainly become, in, to my mind, much more available and freer. What, <laughs> you know, how the regulators then do it and uh, so on is slightly different, but I think it, it, it will happen. Uh, and then I think finally, and this you might think I'm a little bit sort of off the ball really, but because artificial techniques are advancing so rapidly, I do wonder whether in the first instance, for example, for patent litigation, or indeed maybe even other kinds of litigation, um, uh, uh, an initial judgment in the first case couldn't possibly be made by an artificial intelligence judge uh, I mean, um, there's, uh, here you've got your two sides, they've got all of the, they put forward all of the data, the, the, the judge looks at it, the judge looks at previous cases, the judge looks at that, uh, and this can all be programmed. And then the artificial intelligence judge says, well, I don't know, I reckon there's a 99.773.0 case that the plaintiff is, is right or not, and whatever it might be. Um, and, uh, and, and probably technically, uh, such a decision might actually be, be, I would have thought, perhaps quite valuable. But I feel equally certain that uh, there would need to be a second instance in which a human judge would have to say yay or nay. But you could see, the, I could see that, that, that happening in the 10-year time scale, that there's an artificial intelligence judge there. You're muted, Axel. Sorry. Um, I tend to to like it, but um, <laughs> I, I tend to prefer AI assisted than uh, full, you know, oh, artificial okay, intelligence. Okay, okay, but okay. So that we we won't be entirely replaced in ten years, and maybe you know uh, three AIs will be discussing about the topic about the future of AI. No, I hope that we will will still have a role. Uh, but so it was the last question. And I think that uh, we could have continued for hours, but it is now time for, to conclude. Uh, I would like to thank you very much, Marta and Stephen, for sharing your knowledge. That's been very helpful. Your expertise is key, and I'm sure that uh, you know that will be used for for the, at least the next two, five to ten years. Thank you also to all of you for watching this webinar. Thank you for Elsa uh, for organizing and for IP Council. As explained before, you can send your questions related to this webinar to info at 4ipcouncil.eu. We also encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter to receive IP news and the list of the future events. You will find the form to subscribe on our website, www.4ipcouncil.com or using um, a QR code that you should have uh, seen yeah, on the first slide, I suppose. Okay, thank you very much for watching and goodbye. Okay, thank you, Axel. Thank, thank you, Martha. Bye bye. Yeah.